Well, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everyone, wherever you may be across the world. Thanks so much for joining us yet again live today for Serverless Office Hours. Today we are actually streaming on the Serverless YouTube channel and on LinkedIn Live. Uh, the AWS Twitch channel has been overtaken by this little security focus conference called AWS Reinforce, which is happening this week. Um, so uh, please watch this uh, first, and then you can head back over to, uh, uh, to get all the goodies on AWS Reinforce. Uh, today I'm super happy because we actually are talking about security-related things. And I'm uh, excited to have Deepti Chelepati, who's a product manager for AWS. Deepti, how are you today? Hi, Julian. I'm great. Uh, thanks a lot for having me here. Uh, Pleasure. So you've been at Amazon for quite a few years. What, have, what sort of drew you to AWS? And what other exciting things have you done at AWS before, uh, um, before doing cool security stuff at Lambda? Oh, yeah. It's definitely quite a time. Uh, I spent four years in EC2. I, I actually didn't think I would come to AWS right out of B school. I thought I would go uh, sell some third party ads at Amazon. But uh, someone at AWS said, you know, you should just be riding the growth and be part of the cloud. So I took a chance and I, looking back, I definitely think it's worth it. Uh, I can't really imagine how else it would have been otherwise. Oh, good. Well, it's good to hear you say that rather than going, well, not sure if it was really <laughs> worth it. Otherwise, we'd all, be, <laughs> we'd all be in trouble. But Deepti, I know you're also a keen photographer as well. Is that, uh, is that your sort of weekend hobby after you've um, been wrangling the lambdas all week? Yeah, I'm glad you asked. I actually love doing some photography. Um, I sort of go between portraits and some landscapes, like because Pacific Northwest has so much good views and hikes. And I do some paint too but only if my three-year-old allows me to do all these things so i try <laughs> to sneak around <laughs> so that's not even not often or as late at night yeah i always yes. love having people I, who are creative also in, the, in our industry some people i think think tech is not a creative industry i certainly disagree i think there's amazing designing and building and architecting going into it um i'm terrible with a paintbrush so it's good to have other other people who uh who are a bit more artistic at least on the visual arts than i am and I'll, I'll work in the technical um, architecture kind of side. But over to you, Chris. Uh, Chris, you are a, a solutions architect, or well, principal solutions architect, which in AWS parlance means you certainly know what's going on. Yeah, what's your story, Dan? <laughs> yeah, thanks, Julian, and uh, great to be here today. So uh, so I've been here about four and a half years. Um, I've had a chance to work with a number of our customers here based in the Southeast uh, area. And um, uh, yeah, I've worked on a lot of different uh, projects, uh, a lot of really interesting customers from some uh, healthcare data analytics customers uh, to uh, a uh, hospitality uh, hotel company uh, to one of our, uh, uh, if you will, sister companies uh, in the media space uh, that, that many folks watching might, uh, might know about also helping them uh, with their uh, architecture and infrastructure. Um, one of the really cool things that I've gotten to see, though, is as uh, as serverless technology has really matured uh, over the years, um, I've really gotten a chance to see some of our customers make use of serverless to really become a lot more agile, uh, innovate much, much faster. Uh, and it's really cool to see the way that some of our customers are start starting to disrupt uh, the industry uh, by using serverless technologies to move faster. Well, awesome to have you. I'm just going to have a look back over the past week of the world of serverless, and then we're going to get straight back to Chris and Deepti. So don't uh, don't head away. Well, last week we had a super cool episode with uh, Ben Smith on my team talking about the AWS Step Functions Workflows collection. So this, if you want to find those Step Functions Workflows in code that you can use and implement in your applications, that's all on serverlessland.com. I will have a link a little bit later. But yeah, Ben had a really good work, uh, really good uh, chat with Ben. Work, uh, walking through all the different use cases for step functions and how uh, this is really good, you know, sort of orchestration in code and step functions makes that really easy and now even easier because you can just download and copy the code uh, yourself. So it has been a busy uh, past week in the world of Lambda. We are going to cover attribute-based access control uh, today, um, but also AWS has announced support for the new IAM condition key, and this is the source function arm. Uh, deep to your Chris, seeing we are talking about uh, security today, how should customers think about this? Yeah, so basically the source function on is a new condition key. 
So think of it this way, uh, customers write code that calls other AWS services all the time, like S3, Event Bridge, And oftentimes they would want to make sure, okay, who is the one that's calling my service or who is the one that's calling this AWS service? And may want to also set some security boundaries or permissions around restring, restricting it to that specific function. And this just makes it easy because Lambda essentially injects it in the credentials that are being made available to the code. So now customers can write policies around it and uh, ensure uh, secure access to the AWS SDK. Okay, so, so is that sort of a two-parter, one for the secure access and then one also for the visibility? Because I know some services and some other kind of things like, oh, which Lambda called me? Uh, does this help with that as well? Yeah, I actually just learned that a Secrets Manager service is also going to use it because customers use some services where they, in, they provide the function to those services and the services also want to know to make sure that the authorized function is supposed to be calling the service API, like maybe ah. submitting a secret to a Secrets Manager. So in that, that is case, excellent. Because I'm actually writing a blog post on Secrets Manager at the moment. And in my head, I'm already thinking, you know, Secrets Manager can rotate Lambda functions, uh, uses a Lambda function to rotate secrets. And yeah, you really want to make sure that the right um, uh, the right Lambda function is rotating them. And when you are getting or setting secrets that uh, the getter or the setter is expecting, uh, you're expecting the Lambda function. I like it. Good on Secrets Manager. And then also, oh, I didn't want to uh, miss out EventBridge because this is actually a super interesting one. Sort of some new CloudFormation event notifications um, are available in EventBridge. So if you are doing things with CloudFormation and you want to be uh, react with them with the awesomeness that is EventBridge, then certainly go uh, and have a look at that new release. In terms of blog posts that have been coming out, uh, the top one is interesting because uh, we're talking about mainframe jobs to run in step functions. So you may think mainframes are old and crusty and, and on-premises and in the data center. Well, you can migrate some of those JCL jobs to serverless using step functions, and that's certainly going to hopefully give you a bit more uh, agility. Um, I've actually got a blog post I wrote uh, uh, just over a week ago, which is all about Lambda scaling and throughput. And this just helps you understand concurrency and how Lambda can scale down and how it can scale up and how you can monitor it and how you can reason about it and understand it. So yeah, certainly if that is something of interest for you, uh, please uh, please have a look. And then also uh, Code Whisper in the Lambda console. That is also super interesting. We're hoping to get Mark on uh, uh, serverless office hours in, in a while. And this is basically machine learning in the Lambda console to suggest code snippets that you can use in your code. So if you if you have a comment that you type out going uh, retrieve data from S3, knows the language you're running, could be Node or could be Python, and just uh, uh, suggests some code that you can input in, which makes your development process much easier. Also coming up soon, uh, in fact, next week on Serverless Office Hours is Lambda Power Tools for TypeScript. So uh, Sarah Garian has put together a really good uh, uh, blog post for that. So if you are wanting to implement well-architected best practices in your serverless applications, uh, Lambda Power Tools for TypeScript is now uh, generally available. And Power Tools is already out for Python and uh, Java. Uh, it is AWS Summit season at the moment. Despite Reinforce happening going on, there are plenty of other events. Uh, so Sao Paulo, Brazil is the next one coming up on the 3rd to 4th of August. And my uh, good friend and colleague, Eric Johnson, will be there. So if you're anywhere in the Sao Paulo, Brazil area, please go and say uh, hi to Eric and make sure that you get him a diet, Dr. Pepper, if they hopefully have that in Brazil, because then you will be his friend for life. So on to today, let's head back to what we're talking about this week, which is Lambda Attribute Based Access Control ABAC. Chris Tias up here. What is ABAC? Yeah, so I think before starting with ABAC, let's uh, maybe take a step back and, and talk about uh, role-based access control first. Uh, so Julian, if you want to throw that slide up there for me, uh, yeah, we'll certainly. kind of uh, kick off with uh, a little bit of uh, chat maybe around uh, uh, just role-based access control. Uh, so as we think about security uh, in the cloud, even, even non-cloud environments, uh, typically what we want to do is we want to take a, a user, give them certain permissions to access certain services. Um, every time we, we do this, we're going to identify which, uh, hopefully identify which API calls uh, a user is, is getting permission to, and then specifically what services uh, they're, they're getting access to. Um, we do this with, with roles, and uh, when we build these out, we're oftentimes identifying the specific uh, Amazon resource number or ARN uh, that's going to be, that these permissions are going to be applied to. And that gives us a, a chance to really restrict the, the access 
uh, down to what we call least privilege, right? Um, uh, so, you know, if I'm working at a, at a company, uh, you know, I might have access to certain services, but Julian, I might not want to give you access to those services. And so we need to restrict things down tightly so that uh, I'm only able to do what I'm able to do. Uh, and you're given permissions to, to what, uh, what we want uh, you to have access to. Um, but this can, you know, when we're, we're building applications that maybe are using lots and lots of services, or even in the case of Lambda, if we have lots and lots of Lambdas, uh, this can be a little bit difficult if, uh, let's say I have uh, a security administrator uh, that's developing and building all of these policies for me. Uh, the, the big challenge is uh, every time I want to add a new Lambda function or add another service to my application, I need to go back to that security administrator and ask them to uh, add that ARN uh, to the policy uh, so that I can get access to it. As you can imagine, uh, I don't know if you've ever worked in a company, uh, Julian, where you're, you're having to coordinate a lot of those actions, but it can be, uh, can be a little tough sometimes. Uh, while you're oh, waiting absolutely. for those permissions to be given, because right? often, often developers also don't necessarily have the rights to create all those roles and permissions. So they are logging tickets for a central services team, a security team, or some other platform team to be a, uh, to be able to handle that. So, and That's obviously, right. I don't know about the permissions that you write, Chris, but the permissions I write often aren't correct first time. So I have to iterate <laughs> to go back to them, and then they need to be fixed because totally you know, I didn't do it right the first and time. And as a developer, I typically will—I uh, shouldn't say typically—I. I will at times create a sort of a bigger, broader set of permissions uh, just so I don't have to deal with it. The so easy I don't option. have to go back to somebody. I take the easy option, right? Um, so we want to we want to really create a, a better path for developers to uh, work with their security administrators in a way that's a little bit more scalable. And so Deepthi and, and team uh, created, oh, that's funny, uh, created a, um, uh, what's called attribute access control, attribute-based access control. Now, I saw a funny post this week, uh, Julian, about uh, attribute-based access control. What in your mind would be an attribute? Like, I think about my code, and somebody posted, "Hey, my code when I write it is, you know, not that great. It's a little uh, <laughs> underwhelming." And, and is that an attribute I can use uh, for I like payback, that. right? Yeah, um, you're being shamed for your you're being shamed security wide for your code. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Based on your attributes. So with with attribute based ask, access control, what we're doing is um, we're basing it on uh, who is getting access based on a tag key and tag value that are being applied to uh, to the role that I'm using as well as the services that I'm uh, trying to connect with. Um, this is something that AWS has been building now into a lot of different services. Uh, it's uh, still an area that's growing, um, but particular today, of course, we're talking about Lambda. So the cool thing about this is uh, when, when I apply a tag, say a project name uh, or um, maybe a team name to my role in IAM, uh, I can then uh, get access to the other Lambda functions that also have that, that same tag. So maybe let me show a, a little picture here that might demonstrate this a little bit. So in this case, you can see we've got three users, uh, one with a red tag, one with a blue, and one with a green. And we're using those tags uh, to identify what services each user should have access to. So the cool thing about this is, is uh, when, I'm, when I, my security administrator builds the initial policy, they can build in these conditions for tags and then uh, as I'm using new services and creating new Lambda functions, I can create them with the tag that I need to, to have access to it. Once I've created it with that tag, then other users aren't going to be able to make use of it. Uh, and it restricts that, that permission boundary down to just who has tags, who has the right tags. So Chris, customers were already using tags with functions. And so now you're saying like we can actually, they can use it for authorization as well. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, good call out. So today, a lot of customers are using tags um, for a couple of different reasons. We've talked a lot about tags uh, in, a, in uh, different blogs around uh, how to use them for cost um, uh, allocation. Uh, so when I'm looking at my AWS bill, I can see you know, maybe what services are using the most cost or what projects are using uh, the most services based on those tags. 
I can also use tags sometimes to organize, uh, you know, my functions, organize my services. So when I do a search, I can search for a tag. Uh, but today with Lambda now, we're adding the ability to do security by those same tags um, so that, uh, you know, users or customers don't necessarily need to uh, recreate a new tag strategy if they already have one. They can use that same tag strategy today uh, to add permissions models on top of it. Yeah, it's a good call out. Okay. So as I mentioned, uh, attributes are, are based on tags. Uh, and so we're gonna do a little bit of an example with a, a team called Fusion. Um, and uh, we, what we wanna do is we wanna be able to give this, uh, this Fusion team access to some Lambda functions. Uh, but let's say they, they actually start off with a brand new uh, uh, Lambda function, no Lambda functions in their accounts and uh, they wanna create some new ones. So the first thing is we wanna actually give uh, a developer the permissions to create a new function uh, based on the fact that that tag is applied. Uh, so Deepthi, you've talked a lot about how important uh, actually tagging on create is uh, as we've talked in the past. Maybe you can help us understand a little bit more uh, about tag on create and what that means and, and how that, that helps us. Yeah, so I think like you just said earlier, tagging is used for organizing and now for security. So in order to ensure security administrators as they are using tag based authorization, uh, they want to also make sure that developers actually insert tags when they are creating the functions, because if you don't tag the function, then the rest of the authorization would not work as desired. So that is why this is one of the key steps. And it's very easy to enforce because all they have to do is make sure they use this new two condition keys, like setting the request tag and tag keys. So tag keys, you can restrict it to a specific tag key name and request tag is saying either you uh, check for the value of the tag itself or uh, like you showed earlier, you can even match it with the tag on the role associated with that user. So this step will make sure the administrators are ensured that every developer, uh, whenever they are creating new functions, they also tag. Otherwise, uh, the creation of the functions would fail right away. Yeah. And that's an important point because I don't think we want um, uh, developers, uh, you know, to just create a bunch of functions and not necessarily have them tagged. It's actually helpful uh, to enforce that tag uh, when we create a new Lambda function. So this um, is even that, before the authorization has happened. As you create yeah. a Lambda function, it's going to say, hang on, you're not allowed to create the Lambda function because you don't even have the tag. That's Correct. right. That's right. So let's... Uh, that's a good point. Too. Also, That's just a, want to yeah. add there, like I think it also minimizes the churn that you talked about earlier, right? Because if they don't tag or apply a wrong tag and the authorization doesn't work, then the developers again have to go and talk to security administrators to make sure. So I think that is why this is a crucial step for customers. That's right. That's right. So let's take a look at maybe what uh, what this might actually look like in practice. So. Let me just bring up a, a couple of things here. This is uh, my IAM console, uh, and I have a test role that I've created for us today. Um, in my role, uh, in this case, it's called the ABAC test role. I've actually added a Team Fusion tag to it. And so this will help us uh, uh, as we assume the role uh, to actually then create the Lambda function. Um, so let's take a look at... Um, maybe what it looks like to create a Lambda function using tags. So here you can see I'm actually using this ABAC test role in my account. And I'm right at the Lambda create function page in the console itself. So I'm gonna create a new Lambda function. Let's call it uh, ABAC test function. And I'm sure I've created a bunch of these now. So we'll call it 10. And with any Lambda function, we need to give it an execution role. Now, if I were to just uh, try and create the function here, I'm actually gonna get this, uh, this error that I've probably timed out. <laughs> let's see, let's make sure I'm still active here. Okay, so ABAC. 
payback test function 10. And if we create it without, while well, we're trying to just create a new role. Now, one of the important things with ABAC is if I, as a developer, have the ability to create a role myself, then I can create a role, give myself all sorts of permissions, right? Uh, so I actually, with this role, don't have permission uh, to create a new role. So if I were to try and create my function, I actually get this not authorized to perform this uh, because uh, I don't have the ability to create role, okay? So I've actually, as the security administrator today on the back end, created a couple of roles that we can apply. Just Chris, jumping into that, that uh, I just wanted to highlight that error message that came up. I believe the error message has also been, well, over the past years, they've been beefing up those error messages rather than just computer says no, not allowed. And so I think even <laughs> right. because no identity-based policy allows a Lambda creator to roll action, and I think there's a lot more information in that because there's nothing more frustrating than not knowing why it hasn't happened. And you've got obviously, you know, resource-based policies, identity-based policies, all these different kind of things. So yeah, it is just, uh, you know, kudos and the IAM team for um, uh, helping us out there when um, when things do go wrong is telling us where to look. Totally, totally. Yeah, I think this is a, a really helpful error message because it actually tells us that, the, that I don't have permissions to run this IAM create role. Uh, I'll show another error in just a moment that uh, gives us an indication that it's actually a problem with my tag versus the IAM create role uh, permission itself. Uh, so I've gone ahead and selected a role that I created before. Now to add tags, I'm gonna come in here and do uh, advanced settings. Now let me just show what it looks like if I try and create a function without adding a tag. Remember, my policy right now says I have to have the fusion uh, team tag uh, applied here in order to create my function. So if I go to create it, but uh, but there's no tag at all, I'll get this no identity based policy allows Lambda create function action. And this is telling me that the condition that I have on my role doesn't allow me to actually create the function the way I'm trying to do it now. So I'll go ahead and add a tag. And let's uh, let's just add a, a funny tag like uh, like Team Julian. Now in this case, I've added a tag, but it should still fail because uh, the tag fusion uh, doesn't actually uh, have. I'm not applying that to my uh, my lambda function yet. So I'll still get this error that says no identity based policy uh, allows the create function action. Um, so that tells me that there's something wrong with my tags. Uh, I'm not applying a tag that actually gives me permission to create the function. But if I go ahead and, and turn this into Team Fusion, now I should be able to should be able to create the function. Is there a space after Team? I may have spotted that. Oh, good spot, good eyes. There we go. Okay, so now you can see with Team Fusion as a tag, I can actually create my Lambda function here. Um, if I go into the configuration, we can see under tags that this uh, this tag would show up here, except I actually didn't give myself permission to see tags. So I can't see the tag here. But if you had permission, you'd be able to see the tag fusion uh, based on here. Now, I also have set my permissions so that I can't change the tag only because I don't want to remove a tag that, that um, uh, gives me access to the Lambda function and I'll all of a sudden lose that tag there. Um, but that might be something maybe that you want to do is, uh, you know, depending on your situation, is have access to change those tags. Yeah, I suppose this does bring up the, the point that previously when tags were only used for categorization and for, uh, you know, if you're looking in CloudWatch metrics, for example, and you can use tags and you can add them to resource sets and there's a whole bunch of cool stuff you can do with tags, but not, not security related, that in a right. way you didn't mind if people could just amend tags, you know, at will and change things around. You know, one of the caveats with using attribute-based access control is tags are now tags equal security. So you're gonna need to yes. think about how you want to manage that. Yeah, so uh, so that's a, a super important point. Deepthi, maybe talk us through a little bit of how do we actually protect uh, the ability to create and change and update tags? Um, you know, what are some ways that we can create those uh, security boundaries? 
so i think like tag based uh, like we talked earlier uh, there are some certain controls like customers can set using uh, uh, service control policies so essentially you have the ability to say tag and untag resource apis that lambda has you can restrict access to those as well in a way that the developer doesn't have ability to update the tags on the function itself i think the one that you just shared where you yourself as a security administrator removed access to uh, remove the tag from the function itself i think that's a great way to make sure that the developer won't be able to uh, remove the tag yeah yeah, I think, uh, you know, SCP policies, like you just uh, uh, called out, are important. Um, also, there are some elevated permissions within IAM uh, that uh, are important for, you know, security administrators to, to think about and making sure that, you know, you're not uh, allowing a developer necessarily to elevate those, those permissions. Uh, and there's, uh, you know, a lot of different ways to, to protect those as well. Awesome. So, so that's basically ABAC in a nutshell. Now let's talk about some other possible uh, ways that this could actually be helpful. So uh, when we think about ABAC, it's not just the developer that, that might wanna get access, right? It, it's uh, others, uh, maybe a manager uh, might wanna have visibility into multiple teams. And so you can, if you have tags that are maybe an organization level uh, a manager might be able to uh, then have maybe read access, uh, you know, using a more of an organizational, like say an IT or, uh, you know, maybe a, a pro line of business um, to be able to see across those Lambda functions using ABAC. Um, so that's that's basically it, Julian. That's the that's roughly ABAC. Um, let me just show one more diagram here. Uh, this is a, a case where. Um, we're using, we're giving permission for somebody on Team Fusion to invoke uh, a Lambda function. And in this case, we're, uh, we're allowing them to invoke uh, Fusion Lambda functions, but not Bolt Lambda functions. Uh, so what we can do is, as long as my role is tagged with Fusion, I can do that invoke. But if my, uh, if my tag is, uh, is different, let's say it's, let's say we flip this and all of a sudden I'm, I'm going to change teams and move to the Bolt team. All my security administrator needs to do then is change the tag value on my role, and I no longer have access to the Fusion project, uh, and now I've got access to the Bolt project. That sounds, yeah, that sounds super interesting. Just, um, I forgot to say in the beginning, of course, we are live, so please send us your um, questions about ABAC particularly, and if you do have any other questions about uh, serverless development, that'd be uh, cool as well. Uh, Kumal, uh, uh, Kumal Shah, thank you very much for joining us via YouTube. Is there anything extra one needs to do in CDK to use uh, uh, to use ABAC? I would say that there must be something to to set the the, uh, the condition keys, but I think CDK would support all of the IAM condition keys that are available for Lambda. That's right. Basically, like just uh, CDK supports all the things that Lambda APIs already have, so they just have to pass the tags in the create function if they haven't, or they can create the function and then tag it later. Okay. Uh, and then Dan dash MBA, is there a way to tell SAM or CDK to tag all resources created with some key value pairs? And even better, I don't even need to answer because I love it when uh, other viewers are helping other viewers. Verve has said you can define tags on the stack level that will propagate to the resources it creates for those that support tagging. 100% Beautiful. Verve, I will, give I, you a, I will give you a virtual free Lambda invocation. Or I'll even give you a million <laughs> for the next month. Julian, you're so gracious. Good. That's so I'm generous super of you. Generous. <laughs> uh, and yes, yeah, so Dan, so putting a tag section into the SAM template global section should propagate to all taggable resources. Uh, correct. So Dan and Verve, thank you very much for joining us and helping each other out. Uh, so I just wanted to... Because there are some specific condition keys, and I know we talked about the CAD, the, the tag keys, and was it the resource key or the request tag? But I know they're, they're basically three additional condition keys: uh, the CAD keys, uh, the 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 tag keys, which controls whether a tag uh, can be used in a request, and then there's also the request tag and the resource tag. You want to just dive into the difference between those, 
I'll post them into the chat as well, just because it's sometimes uh, not so easy when you can't really um, uh, work out what I'm talking about. So yeah, the totally. Condition keys. Yeah, and I'll show that here. I'll, I'll show this back on the slides again. So in this example with uh, create function, we actually have the request tag, uh, and we're looking specifically for the team key uh, in the request tag. And so uh, request tag is one of them now that Lambda supports as a condition key. And, and this is basically a tag uh, key value pair that's added to a, uh, an API call, if you will, so a request. So in this case, we're sending a request into Lambda to create function. And we want that, um, uh, we want that uh, team tag to equal fusion on that API request in order for it to pass. Uh, if it's not, like we saw in the demo before, if it's some, a different tag or the tag doesn't exist, uh, then actually this condition will force that API call to fail and you won't be able to create your Lambda function. And I want to add to this where here we are actually using a hard-coded value of fusion. What you can also do is use this another condition key called the principal tag. Yeah, just like how it is written here. And this will make it basically, if you want to switch a user from one project to another, you can just do the shift on the IEM role side and don't have to even touch the policy at all. That's right. So, so in this case, with other API actions that are uh, not create function or, or tag resource, so things like invoke function or uh, some of the configuration changes that you might be making to a Lambda function, uh, those are going to use resource tag. And in this case, your Lambda function already exists, right? So uh, we're going to take a look at the tag that exists on the Lambda function. And uh, we're going to look to see if there's a team tag. And we want the value of that team tag to also equal the value of the team tag on our role. Uh, so that's what this principal tag is referring to is what's tied to my role uh, that I'm assuming to make these API calls. So as long as those two are, are equal, then we'll allow this, uh, this action to occur. But if those tags don't equal for whatever reason, uh, then we're not gonna be able to invoke, uh, in, invoke our function in this case. Okay, so also, I mean, one of the, the big stories of the attribute-based access control is being able to scale out your permissions because you're not having to sort of handcraft the, the IAM policies. I mean, you have sort of you have you know spoken about that here, but what should what should customers think about about you know as their uh, lambda function permissions scale? Uh, you know, thinking about ABAC. Yeah, so a couple of things I'll mention, and then uh, DP, I know you've got some other thoughts too, but. Uh, you know, as you're so scaling your Lambda permissions is is absolutely critical, uh, you know, especially to, to larger, uh, uh, say, maybe teams or projects. Um, a couple of things to think about is one is you, you still want to be careful about least privilege. Uh, so sometimes when we're scaling permission sets or scaling roles, it's easy to say, well, this is going to get complex. And so I'll just wildcard some things and give myself lots of access. Or um, uh, So you still want to make sure that you're uh, using least privilege with security. That's still a best practice. Uh, but the good thing is with ABAC, you're using tags. So you don't have to uh, uh, identify each individual Lambda function in your policy uh, that you need to get access to. You can use those tags to help scale that for you. Deepthi, what are your thoughts? I think you touched upon it. Like basically, least privilege is one of the things that we, you know, recommend customers as a best practice to make sure they are securing their Lambda functions, and this just makes it easier at scale. Yeah, and the thing was, I was I was going to add as well as obviously the examples to make it easy to understand is just using a, a single tag as well. But when you're scaling this out, you've really got the option to add you know multiple tags and quite a few tags to your uh, to your serverless applications. So you know yeah. you could think there may be an individual uh, tag like the project name and the actual organization that sits within to within that, maybe a cost center, and then even within that project name, there could be you know a dev environment, a UAT environment, a you know, something like that. And you can actually get particularly granular with tags. And some people get a bit uh, freaked out with I'm going, oh, the more granular I get, the more complicated it's going to get. I've got all these uh, roles happening. And this is exactly what tags uh, helps, that you're not 
you can get granular without losing the uh, without making it overly complex. And because That's tags right. are also understandable, you're not copying arms between various uh, uh, you know arms in condition keys and resource policies and all that kind of thing, which you know we're all, all understandable. An arm is super powerful, but it's not that easy necessarily to read and copying and pasting and can uh, can make some errors. So definitely, I mean my advice is go mad on keys and uh, you know, go mad on tagging, sorry, even for your app, uh, even for your applications. And I alluded to that earlier. When you, even you're doing observability and monitoring, uh, you know, you can get head into the CloudWatch dashboard dashboard, and just by, uh, you know, selecting tags in your application, you can, you know, if you've got a big account with lots of different Lambda functions, lots of different things happening, well, you can sort of bound your view using, uh, using your tags. And right. uh, you can also right. use... RAM, uh, resource resource access manager. There we go. I picked that out of my head. I thought I was going nice. to forget. So, Love it. <laughs> so yeah, resource access manager is a is a service where you can use tags to sort of group your applications together. So even within a single account, and of course, we would love you to have many accounts uh, to separate your applications, but that's obviously not viable for uh, for many organizations. And so, using tags is the way to actually. And separate and distinguish your different applications and your different environments of your applications or, or, or even your teams. And so uh, using this, you know, uh, remote access manager and uh, uh, not app config, AWS config also uses tags that you can then, um, you know, run certain, um, run certain config rules against, you know, some of your applications and that's all divine, defined with tags. So yeah, definitely go, go mad and investigate tags if you haven't done that. And yeah, this just takes it, I think, to another whole level to be able to bring in the permissions and um, IAM policies as part of that. And it's sort of simpler to understand. Well, it, at least in my mind, for my when my brain is doing um, <laughs> pretzel knots when I'm looking at IAM. <laughs> yeah, totally, totally. And, and uh, one thing to call out with that too is if you've got multiple tags that are applied to your resources, you can actually add multiple tags into these policies as well as you're creating them. Uh, so uh, I'm showing a, a just sort of a very simple form with a single tag just to help all of us kind of get our head around these policies. But uh, you can make them, you, you know, add multiple tags into those conditions that all have to match in order for the permission to to be allowed. Yeah, no, they're super useful. And just I had missed a comment earlier from Verve, which made me chuckle when you're talking about this at the beginning. They want a code guru feature request tag lambda function bad code findings count by author using Git blame. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. So so when it's denied by the policy, something gets logged to say, hang on, how many how many yes. denies have you done? I did chuckle. I, so I feel you. like we we could create a trigger or something in uh, code pipeline, right? That actually looks for that. Does it get blame based on tags? Somebody's got to create that and put it up in GitHub. That'd it's be amazing. Prob it's probably already there. I think, yeah. <laughs> That's so um, just to sort of zoom out a little bit, do, do you have sort of any other advice for uh, people looking at IAM? It may not be ABAC or RBAC, but when people are thinking about um, uh, security for the serverless applications in terms of IAM, sort of what best practices would you suggest people think of? Yeah, let's see. So some good practices on, on securing serverless uh, applications. So funny you, you should bring that up because uh, we, we actually do have a workshop out there on securing serverless um, that, uh, that has some good uh, best practices on it, not just with IAM, but with other areas of serverless uh, around uh, code dependencies and uh, you know, using authorization. Uh, but I would say with, uh, with serverless uh, applications, um, you know, one of the big challenges is, of course, that you're breaking things down into microservices, and now you have all these little pieces that you want to make sure have permissions to talk to a downstream service, but you're still using least privilege uh, in order to get there. Um, and so, you know, you'll still want to be thoughtful about how you're constructing those policies uh, to make sure that, that uh, say, your Lambda function only has access to that downstream destination. Yeah, and then only you know, if it's reading from a database or DynamoDB, it's only got read access. Right. And you know, uh, I know it's not always easy, but you know, splitting those lambda functions up, one that does put uh, put access, one that does got get access, and separating those permissions out. And I find, I actually, when I often think about the sort of microservice architectures and splitting up to use more lambda functions, it's it's literally the the security aspect of it that drives that for me in my head because I. I know 100% that I'm going to have um, my reading from a database, or you know, reading from event, or reading from an SQS queue, or you know, writing to SNS or something. You know, it's, it's scoped down so much that any security auditor can look at this lambda function, look at the role, and it is just 
so much simpler that you're not wading through a whole bunch of stuff trying to work out what this uh, what this function actually is going to do. And if you are just um, if you are then migrating bigger applications that have maybe been in a container or on prem or even on EC2 to Lambda, and those functions are big and you are splitting them up, uh, um, I am Access Analyzer is a super useful tool because that can actually uh, tell you exactly what access your Lambda function is actually using, and you can compare that against the iron policy you've got and do a bit of a sort of shrinking down to what you need. That's right. That's right. I do think least privilege is still the number one uh, best practice to follow. Uh, e even even when I'm building uh, small applications, I'm liable to just mess things up, right? So if I'm using least privilege uh, and I've got a Lambda function that's only supposed to read, uh, I know I'm not going to, you know, accidentally write something out to my database, uh, you know, and, and kill my database. So, uh, you know, least privilege uh, is, a, is a great best practice to continue to follow. Great. Yeah. Uh, anything else from you, Deep T, on just sort of the bigger picture of uh, service and security? Not to just name you quickly. <laughs> I think you covered it all. I was thinking more about the Lambda execution role, but I think you covered that as well in terms of the least privilege. OK. Um, yeah, just uh, if you are scrolling back on the chat, I have put some links in there while we've been uh, while we've been talking. Um, most importantly, is Chris has done a, a blog called "Scaling AWS Lambda Permissions with Attribute Based Access Control." Wow, I managed to get that out. Uh, that's a mouthful. <laughs> that is a mouthful. I'm uh, I'm impressed. Uh, and um, so that's on the AWS Compute blog. I have linked to that first, and within that blog, that's also got a whole bunch of other links which may be super useful. Uh, two of the really important ones are: What is ABAC for AWS? And this was really useful because this sort of explains in broader strokes, not just serverless, not just Lambda, but what ABAC is, what the philosophy of it is, and how you can think about it for your uh, applications in general. And then obviously, uh, which services do, uh, which AWS services that do work with IAM, and uh, that obviously has got a list there as well with, a or, uh, with ABAC. And nice to see the nice green tech for Lambda to be able to supporting ABAC as well. Uh, what else have I added in? I, the security, uh, serverless security workshop, which uh, Chris spoke about, I've put a uh, link in link into that as well. Um, uh, one other thing, oh, I did want to bring out was on, on my notes is also the ABAC for Lambda function support is also available through many AWS Lambda partners. So companies, if you're using their tools such as Lumigo and Pulumi and Vertical Relevance, and they already have the support uh, available in their tools. So this isn't an AWS only thing. Super happy to have our partners being able to um, provide even better security for your for your Lambda functions. I am just looking through. Any, anything else, uh, Chris? What have we forgotten to speak about? Or Deep D? Uh, anything else you'd like to add? I think on my list, that was uh, that. That's all the different topics that uh, that I had to talk through on uh, on ABAC. Really appreciate the time to uh, to share about this today. Yeah, pretty excited for customers to try and give us some feedback. Thanks, Deep T. Well, Deep T. Uh, I promise you, not everybody's going to know, but what's coming up next for Lambda and security? <laughs> We're just among friends here. <laughs> I'm sure there are plenty of things going on. I'm not trying to get you into trouble or all of us into trouble. Uh, but yeah, you know, uh, security has been job zero for AWS and specifically for Lambda for you know a while now. So it's encouraging to see all these new uh, security capabilities coming uh, coming up. Yeah, I mean, I can uh, share a few. Like, we are definitely working actively on helping to make it uh, easy to set up cross account and cross service access, like, especially being able to plug in a full JSON policy. That actually also simplifies the ABAC for cross account and cross service as well. Um, and that's, I think, is a more long standing request for us. So, that's definitely in our radar. And uh, we are working on a bunch of governance related issues as well, like cost management, simplifying cost related things. Uh, so those are coming out. So yeah, I think if you if you and the viewers have any feedback on what should we be working on the most, uh, we're always uh, happy to take it. Yeah, pleasure. And that, I mean, that's the cool thing of having people like Deep T on the call is, you know, Deep T is literally building all this part of Lambda. And, you know, we, we love listening to customer feedback. And I was on a call with somebody yesterday getting some cool feedback and, you know, uh, helping the, the product managers like Deep Tea uh, connect with people. So please, if you have good ideas and uh, uh, things you would like Lambda to improve and not just Lambda, anything, uh, any of the service, we literally are all ears. Uh, you can send your comments directly to Deep Tea to, or to Chris or to myself, and I'm happy happy to pass them on. So, yeah, please don't feel, please don't feel as though you, you're suffering in silence if there's things you would like. Um, 
And of course, Andreas just jumps straight on. Thank you. When will we have ADAC for step it. functions for the individuals, uh, for the individual states? I I don't know if DT or Chris, you know, but um, I will I will have to ask the step functions team, and I will certainly put that on their on their radar. I think hopefully the internal the, the fact that Lambda's done it will step up the game for step functions, and you know this is a sort of. I think everybody understands the benefit of ABAC, so I'm sure Steph Functions is working on it, but I will certainly contact them and uh, pass your feedback on. So thanks, Andreas. So yeah, let me just switch over and we'll look at uh, talking about what's happening in serverless office hours next week. As I mentioned earlier, we've got AWS Lambda Power Tools for TypeScript TypeScript slash Node.js, and a, a good old Eric Johnson is going to be hosting next week, and we've got two AWS internal people, Sarah and Andrea, and also we've got some um, some folks from Trek 10, Ryan and Jake from Trek 10, and they've been working on this as well. And if you're not aware, Power Tools is a suite of utilities, uh, which is uh, has a whole bunch of utilities for mainly observability, but also some cool other um, utilities as well. A lot of stuff has been gone into... Um, uh, Java and Python, uh, but now this is a new power tools for TypeScript. And also importantly to know, it also can be used in Node.js. So even though the power tools is for TypeScript, you can also use it for your Node.js application. So there'll be plenty of demos. This really, I'm actually building a, a demo at the moment for actually for my blog post doing, talking about secrets. And I'm going to be using uh, power tools for probably Python, I think, just to make that so simple because I can remove so much code from my Lambda functions and make it much easier. So if, you, if you're not aware and you haven't used power tools, so helpful. Um, uh, yeah, really useful to be able to um, get those well-architected goodness into your apps. And um, talking about the Step Functions Workflows connection, that is the link to head to via the QR code or uh, the URL shortener s12d.com slash workflows. Um, it does say 16. I think it's already up to 17. So they're thick and fast. They are coming in. And these are really interesting because as Ben spoke about last week, we've got sort of three different levels. One are fundamental levels, which are these are just small sort of patterns to talk uh, to understand how you can use step functions, and then some actual bigger patterns and a whole bigger applications. So a really good way. And a lot of people are starting to think about when they're designing serverless applications is sort of doing even a um, step functions first approach, especially with the SDK integrations. If there's anything you can do in the SDK um, and you're just using a, a pure native SDK call, um, DeepT would, uh, I think, understand that you don't have to use Lambda for that. You can use step functions. And Lambda, of course, is awesome for so many other things. Uh, for the general patterns collection, yeah, only over 300 patterns over here. So if you're using CDK, SAM, serverless framework, Terraform, and you want to connect Connect, you know, uh, um, event bridge to API gateway, or you want to do something from Secrets Manager or Lambda to SQS. So many snippets of code here. When I'm building my serverless apps, this is where I go because it just saves trawling the rest of the internet looking for um, uh, these code samples. So this is super useful. Well, and that's Julia, it for this week. Know, yes, Chris. Yes, sorry, I was, I was gonna talking say, you know and I going on. Yeah, you know what I love about that is uh, is like develop like most of us that uh, have done development work. Uh, there are so many patterns and, and uh, you know, SAM, SAM files and, and YAML files out there that we can grab to actually help us at, accelerate starting off with these projects, as opposed to feeling like we have to start it from scratch, right? Yeah. Uh, we always love pulling in things that, that help us move faster, and, and I love that, that uh, our teams are creating these very, very quickly. No, absolutely. And also, these are all open source. So if you do have new um, uh, new ones you want to add, please do that. Um, I spotted one or two I'm working on at the moment. And also, we're also looking to expand uh, the languages. So even if you may have seen a... Uh, Lambda polling from SQS, for example. I'm just pulling one out of my out of my head, and there isn't one in .NET. And you're a uh, an excellent .NET developer. Please, we'd absolutely love uh, love to have it. And also, we'd love to have even more. Uh, we've got quite a few in SAM and CDK. But yeah, if you're building in Terraform or using the serverless framework, we'd absolutely love to have uh, as many as possible. It really is super useful for everybody else. But yeah, that's the sort of landing page, serverlessland.com. This is literally everything to do about um, serverless on AWS. Uh, there is, in fact, one additional thing to add. I've just spotted a new update that's happened on this page today. Is actually, I'm based in London, so I can call it home. But uh, on the 1st of September, there's actually an EDA day in London. This is Event Driven Applications Day in London. And we've got some AWS people I'll be seeking as well, and also some uh, literally industry experts. We've got uh, Gregor Hopper who knows more about application architectures than anybody I know. And uh, he was on Service Office Hours a few weeks ago. We'll be speaking. We've got other AWS heroes like Ben Ellaby, um, 
It's going to be talking about minimal viable migrations. So if you're into serverless and certainly if you're excited as I am and all of us are about event-driven applications, that's a live on uh, a live event which will be on the 1st of September. Um, yeah, it's uh, pretty easy to sign up with. I will um, add a link into uh, uh, on Twitter as well so you can have a look. Um, so yeah, plenty going on in the world, uh, in, in the world of serverless. Um, and I really appreciate, Chris and DeepTU, spending time and taking us through ABAC today. Thank you so much, Thank Julian. You. Really appreciate it. Cheers. Well, enjoy the rest of your week. And Eric will um, be chatting about.